uh, <laughs> um, Summit is blessed with a really outstanding public school system. And today we have the superintendent of the public school system, Scott Huff, uh, as our speaker. Uh, prior to be appointing superintendent of schools, he was the assistant superintendent of schools right here in New Providence. Uh, he assumed his position, I would think it probably one of the worst possible times in June of 2020, right in the middle of the worst part of the COVID epidemic. Uh, but he successfully navigated it. He's going to tell us about uh, the overall system of the public schools and talk about some of the key issues that face many school administrators. Scott. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Jim. And thank you for having me here. I'm very excited anytime I get an opportunity to gloat about Summit Public Schools and share all the wonderful things that we do. I'll, I'll take advantage of that. Um, and I want to start by opening and saying I very much appreciate the acknowledgement and recognition of Black History Month. It's a very important time in our schools. We have a lot of wonderful activities going on in each of our schools throughout the grade levels every year this month, and we're very proud of everything that we do. See me there? All right, so I'm Scott Huff. I am in my fourth year as superintendent of Summit Public Schools, and I'm in my 30th year as um, education. Of those 30 years, 18 of it has been spent doing administrative work, whether it was assistant principal, principal, assistant superintendent, and now my fourth year here as superintendent. Absolutely love what I do, and I've come to find an unbelievable community in Summit to do it. Um, even working right next door, right here in, in New Providence for many years, you think you know of Summit, but until you work in the community and get entrenched with the people, uh, you really don't know what it's like. It's a very special place. So I'm happy to be here and share with you some things that are happening in some of the public schools. And like uh, Jim said, some of the challenges that face all public schools in New Jersey these days. All right, some of the public schools. Mission statement, excellent. Summit Public Board of Education operates to the commitment to excellence and the expectation that each student will strive to excel beyond the New Jersey student learning standards, which set forth a minimum level of achievement for all students at all grade levels. Summit Public Schools, in partnership with the community, will support and sustain an excellent system of learning that engages all students in compelling work, educates them to their highest intellectual, creativity, and individual potential, and promotes pride and diversity and results in responsible and productive citizens in the highest integrity. That's our mission statement. We've had that mission statement for many, many years. We may revisit, revisit that mission statement when we um, head into strategic planning in the coming uh, year or two and take a look at um, our vision and our beliefs. We're kind of coordinating two laptops here to make this presentation work, a little technology challenge. A little bit about our organization. We have nine schools, which includes two primary centers, that's pre-K and kindergarten. Our pre-K program consists of three and four-year-olds. We have five elementary schools, which are grades one through five, one middle school, which is grades six through eight, and a high school, grade nine through 12. We have about 700 staff, so we're not a small organization. We're a very large organization, and one of the best things about we're able to have a, a small teacher-to-student ratio, um, which a lot of our parents really appreciate. About 66% of our teachers have a master's degree or higher, and they have the average experience of about nine years in the district or in the industry. We have 32 administrators. Um, I have a cabinet, That's, those are central office administrators, part of my team, there's eight of us. Um, I have three of them with me here today, so I'll introduce them. We have Derek Jess, business administrator is here with me. In the back, I have Laureen Callender, uh, communications officer. And right here, I have Dr. Crystal Marr, Director of Student Personnel Services. About our student population, Summit is an extraordinarily diverse and rich culture, okay? We have, again, over 4,000 students, but it's a, it's a breakdown of a lot of different backgrounds and experiences. We have about 20% Hispanic population, and that's growing. That's growing more and more every year. We have about 10% that's economically disadvantaged. I know many people think of Summit as a well-to-do place, and we are in many pockets, but 10% of our student population are economically disadvantaged. And we know from statistics and historically, those student achievement 
for those students is difficult. They, they, need, they need more supports. So we work hard to try to provide that for them. In a recent survey, we realized we have over 48 languages that are spoken in the homes of our residents in Summit. 48 languages, that's a lot. They come from all over the world and many times they're coming to Summit to take advantage of the school system. About 12.9% special education needs and that tracks pretty much average with the state. Our teaching staff, we really pride ourselves on retaining and recruiting the top, the very, very best. We have many, many staff members who want to come to Summit. We don't just get first year out of college candidates. We get candidates that have been experienced elsewhere. They see an opportunity that opens up in Summit and they take advantage of it and they come to interview. Um, we recently put in a very, very rigorous interviewing process for all positions and I meet individually with each and every certificated staff before I make a recommendation to the board for hire. Uh, the last four years, we've been very busy. There's been a lot of turnover in education. COVID is a big part of that. That really kicked people out that were close to retirement and now we're backfilling those positions. Um, but over the last couple of years, oops, I've hired three new cabinet members, four new principals, four new supervisors, and approximately 185 teachers. So you can see we have each year a very large um, hiring class. And it used to be that the hiring season was in the spring, you get prepared for the upcoming school year, everybody's board approved, you're ready to go. It's all year round. And you'll talk, when I talk later about some of the challenges in education, you'll understand why when I talk about the labor market. But it is, it's an all year round process. We actually have a uh, human resource director that is dedicated to taking care of all the first and initial steps of the hiring process um, before the candidates get to me. I got it. Okay, a little bit about Summit Board of Education. President Yan Cho, Walita Justice, is our vice president. Currently serving is Melanie Cohn, Kelly Stanton, Jennifer Sykes Erday, Eileen Kelly, and Michael Colon. Michael Colon is coming off the board this year. He served six years and he's been an outstanding member. Summit Public Schools is a type one district, which means the board members are appointed by the mayor. There's only about 12 of those districts in the state of New Jersey. All other districts are type two, which means they're gonna have a vote. And candidates that wanna run for board will run for that office and be voted in. Um, in Summit, they can serve, their, the mayor appoints them for three years, and they can serve two three-year terms for a total of six years before they come off the board. So each year I'm getting a new board member. And interestingly, the way the board structures, they rotate the president. So every year I get a brand new board president, someone who's existing on the board already, that will take the position for one year before we get another. The vice president always moves up to president. We operate with an $81 million budget. Again, like I said, not a small organization. Uh, the budget process starts way back in October uh, with, with Derek Jess, our business administrator. And once we prepare our budget, we present it to the operations committee of the Board of Ed. They review and, and approve it to send to the full board for review. Um, we wait for governor's address for state aid. That's coming at the end of the month. State aid is a very important piece of our funding mechanism. We've come to rely on it as every school district does. Um, and interestingly, again, with type one school district, a board of school estimates has to approve our budget, which means that's the mayor, two council members, the board of ed president, and the board vice president. So again, where most districts would have to vote for the board for the budget to be approved, um, our board of school estimates will approve our budget. So well, that's a little bit about the structure of our organization and Jim asked me to talk about some of the challenges that face public education that Summit is not immune to. We are, we are living it. It's not as easy. It's not as easy. It's increasingly harder to work in public schools, whether you're a teacher, an administrator, uh, the demands of student achievement, the demands of parents these days, uh, the demands of being competitive with other candidates and districts. It's all a reality. Uh, the landscape has changed very much over the last couple of years for sure I um, mean even going back 10 years we've seen a dramatic shift in the way schools are able to operate and the challenges that they face so I'm going to review some of those challenges with you here sticking with the theme of budget in the state of New Jersey there's a two percent cap on the increase that we can imp increase our budget every year two percent that's a challenge we don't live in a two percent world everything that we do is three percent or higher so we negotiate with the teachers union, with the, the principals union, the supervisors union, the board of ed does and I, and we come to a contract settlement. 
and we come to year over year annual increases of salary, they're not anywhere below 3% these days. So 83% of our budget is salary and benefits. So if you do the math, it's not sustainable. That's why we talked about state aid. Um, we've come to rely on state aid to bridge that delta between what we're raising by 2% because the board is very fiscal. We have a very fiscal ordinance in Summit um, and we, we really do a, a really hard work to try to keep under 2% and we've been doing that. Um, the mechanism for going over 2% is that the Board of School Estimates would have to improve that increase, okay? Um, so there's opportunity to, to do that, but that's not always the case. You want to be responsible and try to stay under 2%, but that's becoming increasingly challenging. The cost of transportation when it comes to the budget have skyrocketed. Um, we're not a busing district, but our special needs students go to other schools and we have to move students around um, on a smaller scale, but the costs are, are through the roof, three or four times as much as they used to be. Um, and again, that's a product more, more or less of COVID. So the funding and the budgeting, budgeting mechanisms are very challenging. Um, Jim asked me to talk about COVID. I kind of put this in the back of my mind about a year ago and never wanted to mention it again, but you're bringing up some sore spots here. But in, at, in the end of the day, um, we really came through COVID um, strong, stronger than ever. Um, it really tested our community. Um, I'll give you a little bit of the timeline and what, what we went through, but the way schools handled COVID was, you know, everybody's radar, everybody was watching and every community was doing something a little bit different. Uncharted waters, some districts never even opened and it, it took a half a year for them to even get some, some students in the doors. Um, I came aboard, I didn't come aboard in June, Jim, I came aboard in August and middle of August and school opened in like three weeks. So my first decision was what were we gonna do with the students either coming in every other day, every day, half day, and made that decision. Because we were shut down in spring of 2020, so that closed the rest of the year. Come the following year, we opened up with, um, our elementary students were in every day for half a day in person. Then they went home and they were virtual. Our secondary students, which are our middle school and high school students were in every other day. And then they were virtual in the afternoon. And we continued that way that first year until about spring break. And I brought all of the secondary students in every day for the morning session. And then they did virtual in the afternoon. Some of the challenges were immense. The guidelines that the Department of Health and the Department of Education put on schools were just things you can't even think of and fathom. How can we possibly operate this way? Six feet of distance between individuals. Masking, of course. Um, all of the sanitary and, and upkeep and things like that. I remember when I first got here, my first two weeks, I was in Brayton Elementary School with, with then my business administrator, and we were with a tape measurer measuring six feet and marking tape marks on the floors to say, this desk goes here, this chair goes here. How many kids can we fit in a classroom with six feet away? We stripped everything out of the classrooms. So they didn't even look like classrooms. Any extra furniture, cabinets, we had to make the space just because we knew how important it was for kids to be in school, in person with their peers. And we were able to do that. The following year, um, we came back and we were every day in school all day. And that brought its challenges as well. Because once those variants started changing, I remember Omicron, and again, these, these words that I want to choose to forget, hit, we had anywhere from close to maybe 10 to 15% of our population out on a given day. Staffing was incredibly hard. Staff got sick. The, the December month, I don't even know how we were able to stay open. There was day to day where I was going to call the board president saying we have to close. At any moment, we never knew what was going to bring us, but we made it through. And what worked for us? I'm going to tell you what worked for us. We, we approached this with daily communications. Laureen Callender, my communications officer, is absolutely outstanding. We spent hours together every day crafting messages reassuring parents of what's happening, the cleanliness in the schools. We're taking care of all the protocols. Your kids are safe. We built strong relationships in the community. And I have to tell you, the parents supported the schools like you would not believe. They were so appreciative that we were open, but they were scared. Our staff were scared. You know, you're, you're coming to get to, to work with maybe um, a health condition or um, personal reasons or your own family is sick. And it was a very, very challenging time. But the way we approached it with everybody and prioritizing our people in the community, students, staff, parents alike, um, we really got stronger through the process. We 
did things like social emotional learning activities online in the afternoons to keep kids connected to each other. We provided weekly Zoom sessions of meditation and mindfulness for our staff to keep them connected with each other when they weren't in person. Um, we just thought of many, many different ways to communicate and keep everybody connected with one another. And the motto was take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and we'll get through this, and we did. And I think it really built a strong relationship between the teachers union, the administration, the board, and the community. Um, and again, what makes Summit so special, because a lot of communities didn't get through that challenging time as strong as we did. Let me see if I'm right here. All right. Challenges in the, in the labor market. Here we go. Education market is uh, dwindling. Candidates aren't there. They're just not there the way they used to be. Um, number one, we are competing with each other across different districts, just right across the street from each other with salaries because their candidates are able to kind of pick their spot these days. Some very high demand positions like school social workers, psychologists, nurses, the high content level areas at the high school, physics, chemistry, those teachers are very, very difficult to find. Um, kids just not, aren't going into colleges for teaching preparation courses anymore. Between 2009 and 2018 in New Jersey, we graduated 50% less in that time just from New Jersey colleges, but it's a nationwide epidemic. And some of the reasons are kids can come out of college now making more money as a starting salary doing things with AI and online and the virtual world, the jobs that weren't there years ago. Um, that's why you're gonna see when I talk about some of the goals for our district, the vision that we're heading. Um, and people are leaving the teaching industry as well. They're not sticking around like they used to do. So it's becoming increasingly challenging. The job market is changing. In my circles, we talk about it all the time. The governor's trying to help with that. They have a task force out to study it. They're trying to lessen some of the credentials. Um, but the bottom line is, if we want to attract the best teachers and attract people to the industry, we have to pay them. We have to pay them. And when it stacks up as an, an entry level salary, and the increments that these teachers will be getting in their first 10 years, um, the old model doesn't work. So we're really taking a hard look at that um, in all the districts across New Jersey. Safety and security. This is something schools never had to deal with to the level that we do today. Unfortunately, we see and hear all of these things that happen across the nation and across the world, quite frankly. The violence is there. Um, we are required to do four drills twice a year. It's a bomb threat drill, evacuation, lockdown, and active shooter. All of our staff are trained on that. We talk about it all the time. We practice it at least eight times a year, those drills. Um, and we keep those procedures and um, rules that we, the way we, we do these, these drills secret, right? We don't want people to know all of our um, procedures for all of these drills, but we do them. We do them regularly. Um, and, our, and again, our staff are trained. Last year, I completed a security audit throughout the district, which we walked around and took a look at all of our procedures, all of our regulations, our facilities. And as a result of that, we added several more cameras, security cameras. I added a, a visitor management system, so everybody has to show an ID, and that ID name gets um, processed through a database to look for sex offenders. Um, and everyone who comes in our school is recorded and logged. So we're very, very secure. They have to get buzzed in. We, we, we can't come in through any door at any time, and it's very, very um, important and serious. And one of the best things that we have is that we have a wonderful relationship with our police department. Um, I meet with them regularly, all the time about these drills. Part of their patrol is to go into each school and sign in. So every day we have police officers in and out of our schools, and it's not the same time or the same officer. So um, very, very comforting that they do that. Um, but they're also part of our community. They go to our field trips, they go to our barbecues, pool parties. Um, they work with, with us on major events like OM3D. That's a one moment, three decisions that we do at the high school level, which talks about distracted driving. And they work with us to set up a mock crash scene to show the magnitude of what it's like if you're going to drink and drive or be distracted driving. So they're intertwined in the programs that we do, um, not just school safety and security, but also community service. And again, we have a wonderful relationship with them. One challenge uh, Jim asked me to touch upon is bullying. 
So yes, bullying is a word. It's actually called harassment, intimidation, and bullying, known to us as HIB. Um, 2011, Governor Christie passed probably the most comprehensive legislation on how schools approach bullying in the state of New Jersey. I think it's the strongest legislation in the country. It's very, very formal. It's a formal process on purpose. This is as a result of um, a Rutgers student taking their own life because one of their friends added them for being gay. And we wanted to obviously take these things seriously so kids aren't hurting themselves. Um, a little bit about what it looks like. Every report that comes in, we have to investigate. I have an anti-bullying specialist at each school. They're trained to investigate. They give the investigation to the principal who reviews it and approves it. That principal gets, sends that investigation report to me who I review it and approve it. I send it to the Board of Education, who they have to review it and approve it. So you have all these different eyes on this process on purpose to make sure that we don't miss anything. The downfall with that is parents have developed a stigma around this that is um, that they're labeled if you're, if you're guilty of HIB. Student conflict will never go away, and that's what HIB is. Um, it's actually a definition. They, anything that is motivated by an actual or perceived characteristic can constitute a HIB. But going back to the old days, before this law was in place, it was code of conduct. So we actually don't approach or resolve things differently if it's code of conduct or HIB. This is a formal process that we have to follow that's in law. So there, right now there's another task force in the state evaluating the anti-bullying Bill, Bill of Rights to see if there's going to be some changes now that we've been doing it for a good 13 years. So those are some of the, the larger challenges that face us um, in schools today that are present, um, ongoing, um, that we navigate through to continue to stay on top. As Jim said, we're, we're a high-performing district. Our schools are ranked in the, our high schools ranked in the top 10 public schools almost every year, um, top 20, and that's, that's saying something. Um, we continue to do very, very well. We send kids to some of the best colleges, and we teach the whole child. Um, if his college isn't their, their, their vision, their, we give them prepared for the rest of the world and whatever they may do. And part of that is looking forward to the vision of what's going to be next for our future. So the board approves goals that we present to them every year, and we have three goals that we're currently working towards that are multi-year goals um, that we're really very excited about. And we're in probably year two or three already, and we continue to make progress and develop over this. Goal number one, Summit Public Schools will continue to foster an inclusive school community that values diversity, promotes equity, and supports mental health, wellness, and social emotional learning within its climates, operations, curricula, and programs. That's a mouthful. That goal has evolved over the last couple of years to continue to add things like mental health and wellness, um, social emotional learning. Um, it's very, very important to us that we take care of these things and address it. The mental needs of our students, our staff and our parents, they're increased after COVID and that's just not Summit, that's across all school districts. So um, we target those stakeholders. We give programs for our students, whether it be Thrive or advisory programs through our counseling department. Um, we target our staff. This year, I have a wellness initiative with our staff where we're actually providing a day of chair massages, where we provide biometric screening. We have online webinars for self-help and things that they can take advantage of for themselves. And we also target our parents with parent workshops. Um, and we have a big mental health symposium coming up this spring where we're hoping to get anybody and all of you from the community who want to come and a couple hundred people with breakout sessions on topics that are going to help parents help themselves and help their students. Okay, it's a partnership. It's a true partnership and summit between parents, students, and staff. And you can see that here. Got to change the slide, but we, we do. And this represents all three buckets of stakeholders in the community that we address the mental health and wellness and needs for. With that, and you'll see in this goal, we talk about diversity, equity, inclusivity, and belonging. The sense of belonging is critical. If a student isn't available or feels like they're part of the community, they're not available for learning. They're not gonna grow. They're not gonna grow just academically, but social emotionally as well. So it's very, very important to us. So recently we took a look at an assessment of our school district where we were, and you saw the previous slide that we're a very diverse student and family population. Um, and we identified five key areas. We want all of our students to have access and success to academics. 
So we're looking at ways that we can make sure that we have opportunities for kids to get into advanced placement programs and the like, and honors programs in the high school. Professional development. We want to make sure that we are providing our teachers with the ability to connect with each kid in the school, regardless of their background. It won't be uncommon for us to get a student that comes port of entry from a country somewhere else that has no idea about our language and our culture. How do you connect with students like that? Right? The old way of teaching and throwing it up against the wall and something sticks or it doesn't, that doesn't work, that doesn't cut it anymore. We have to connect with each and every student and their understanding and their background. You heard me talk earlier about retention and recruitment. That's a big push for us right now. We're looking to get teachers in the classroom that represent the students they're teaching, that look like them, that they can have connection to. Stakeholder engagement, hugely important. We talked about the communication, partnership with the parents, and multilingual programming. As you saw on one of the previous slides, 20% Hispanic doesn't mean they're not English speakers. Many of them aren't, and we have a growing ESL, which is an English as a second language program in the district that we actually are promoting more teachers to get certified within our ranks to address the needs of those students. Our second multi-year goal that we're working on, Summit Public Schools will continue to improve its ability to utilize data to inform instructional programming and implement strategies that target areas of growth for all students. Critically important, this is where the teaching and learning comes into play and meeting kids at each and every level that they come. You hear about differentiation. We don't just teach to the middle. We have to target each and every student where they are, whether they're at the lower end or whether they're excelling and when they need enrichment and advanced, and advanced um, access to programming and instruction. This is a complicated diagram, but this is a multi-tiered systems of support that we use. And if you look at the bottom of the tier one, that's all students, that's in the classroom. That's meeting kids in the classroom at the different levels of where they are and the teacher being able to differentiate and using their bag of tricks. As you go up and some of the students that need just a little bit more help, they're in tier two. We have programs for them as well that are a little bit more specific, small group, not in the large group. And then obviously, as you move up to tier three, even fewer students that need a lot more help where they may get pulled out of the classroom, meet individually with specialized teachers for specialized instruction. Um, we are really running with this right now. And part of it that helps identify this is we have software programs that track our student learning where they're at. They go on to the programs regularly and they have their own pathway to learning. So we can monitor this through our multi-tiered systems of support all year long. We give an assessment in the beginning of the year, a mid-year, an end year, and we know exactly where we need to target our attention for each and every student. This model works for behavior as well. It's not just academics, behavior and social emotional wellness. And our third goal is Summit Public Schools will, will further the development of science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. that will develop critical thinking and problem solving skills and prepare students for future opportunities in a dynamic global landscape. Again, there's a, it's a mouthful. This is where we are pointing towards the future, pointing towards what we can prepare and give our students to be successful in the years to come. And that's our initiative, investing in the future. We recently secured a bond from the, the city for um, a bunch of new programming and spaces that we're building. It's a very exciting time for us. A couple of years ago, I did an assessment when I first came here, even through COVID, of all of our programming and curriculum, as well as our facility needs and upgrades. And those two things aren't independent. They overlap. They go hand in hand. So when you talk about things like STEAM and uh, innovation, we wanted to have a K-12 STEAM program where all of our kids can benefit from the hands-on learning of the engineering or design process, um, creating things and working with computer science and the like. And it started at the elementary school last year. Thanks to the donation from the Summit Educational Foundation, we were able to equip each of our five elementary schools with STEAM labs, where students will have special programming that they go into the lab with a special teacher and they do problem solving hands-on activities. This has taken off like you would not believe. We get reports from teachers and from parents. The kid that sits in the corner in the classroom during reading or writing and is quiet and doesn't perform shows up in this area and thrives and is a leader and becomes a leader amongst their peers and can handle this type of learning and it's just perfect for them. This is the foundation that they're going to, that they, we grow these skills so that when we move up into our middle school programming, 
which we're going to start next year, we're going to be offering a lot new, many more courses. So the middle school model is an exploratory model, which means we make sure that each student goes through these courses on purpose to see what interests them so that when they get to high school, they can choose an elective or a pathway that they're interested in. Some of the new things we're doing in digital world and robotics and coding that we're going to introduce, environmental issues, video production, computer science. One of the goals here of the middle school program is to pull down the programming we're currently doing at the high school so that our kids can excel even that much further after they get these prerequisites in the high school level so that when they go on to college or beyond, they're even that much more prepared. We'll be able to offer more rigorous experiences at the high school level. Some of the facility upgrades that are happening at the middle school. The middle school is, I think, 101 years old. It's one of the oldest schools in Summit. It's a beautiful building. Um, but it is the only and the last school in the district without HVAC, air conditioning. And even though it's only a few weeks on the beginning and end of the school year, it's brutal in there. It is, it, I, I almost had to close down the heat. So we are getting air conditioning at the middle school and we're very, very excited about that. We're also creating two STEAM labs, which are gonna house our computer science, our robotics and our coding um, courses. We're gonna renovate the concourse that enters the middle school because um, there's nothing there. It's gonna be like a welcoming center for the security guard to be able to screen people as they come in. And we're also going to be doing the athletic field in the back of the middle school. It's gonna remain grass, but we're gonna build a new track, put in some new turf, um, and we, we share those spaces with community programs like Summit Junior Baseball and Softball and the like and soccer as well. So we're really excited about the spaces that we'll be creating in the middle school, including the cafeteria. If you ever had an opportunity to be in our cafeteria at the middle school, it doesn't work. It's an L shape. It, it doesn't house enough seats for the kids. The cafeteria is going to be renovated to be more like a cafe style and be able to accommodate about 400 kids. And the last few years, our enrollment has been rising, so that room is full. So many, many people, teachers, staff, students alike, are looking forward to this renovation. All of this, hopefully, fingers crossed, will be done by September 24. There again, those are actually going to be, this is the middle school. It's going to be our STEAM labs. Um, this is happening right now. You can drive past the middle school and see the construction that's going on. And then as we scaffold up to high school, some new courses that we're looking to offer as far as game design and Python, design projects and computer science, principles of engineering, and even theater. Our theater program is fantastic. And that's the A in STEAM, and we don't want to ignore that. We are going to bring dance to the high school for the first time, a dance program, dance instruction. And with what we do with theater and drama already, we're just going to be able to do that much more. Theater, tech, and design, kids are going to learn even more about lighting and how to build sets and the, the behind the scenes activities that go into these productions. And I encourage you with the, with the spring musical coming up, get to high school, get some tickets and go see it because it's always sold out and it's a fantastic show. And again, more robotics and computer science and coding. How are we gonna accomplish that? The renovations going on at the high school right now are at the media center. The media center is gonna go up to the second floor and we're gonna, um, that's where we're gonna expand the classrooms, flexible rooms where doors, uh, walls can come down, make larger spaces, smaller spaces, breakout spaces. Right now, currently when we do robotics, we have to do it in the cafeteria and pick it up every day, pack it up and then bring it out the next time. We can have a dedicated space for our equipment. It's not typical just chairs and desks in a row. You know, we're, we're using high tech equipment and computers. Again, I mentioned a dance studio. Um, we're going to renovations to the choir and drama spaces we're in a brand new state of the art TV studio, which we have so many kids interested in that right now, being part of TV and design with video um, and not related to the academics, but a major undertaking that's going to happen as well as Tatlock Fieldhouse. That Tatlock has not been touched in, I don't know, 60 years. It's, it's virtually on the, the cusp of falling over. So we are renovating that. Our kids take full advantage of it with our athletic programs, and so many people are excited about that. In addition, the lower field on Morris Avenue, we're gonna turf that. It's now gonna be turfed, which is gonna give it year-round usage, and we're gonna have a nice fence along Morris Avenue to uh, right along with the new field when we get there. So we have a lot of really exciting construction projects going on. You'll see here, these are, these are 
fields for robotics and the equipment, things that we'll be using when we get our new spaces and get our new courses up and running. And I will close my presentation with a video of what our second floor in the media center at the high school is going to look like. And this is the upstairs where all of the new classrooms and instructional spaces will be. At the high school level, the media center is like the hub of the school. Kids take advantage of it during their hour-long block lunch. They go in for extra help. They go in just socialize. So we're maintaining that feel with this, but we're adding the additional instructional spaces, and we're really looking forward to that. And as I said, all of this is ongoing. It's underway. And the high school will probably be targeted to be completed January of 25, maybe February of 25. Um, but this has been in the process for many years. So in closing, I am super proud to be here as the leader of Summit Public Schools. We have a wonderful team. We have a great community. We have support from all of you and our parents. And we are looking towards the future to develop and give our kids the skills and the background they need to be successful in a changing world. Thank you. Okay, anyone who wants to ask a question, please come up. We have some online questioners. We do. We have one. Uh, John Tomaszewski. Zoom question. Okay. Yeah, hi. Uh, a great talk. It looks like you got a bright future. I substituted for a while, and, and two questions that uh, come to me that I always wondered about. One, I noticed that um, the uh, low level classes got like financial help with things like checkbooks and banking and uh, budgeting and uh, none of the upper students uh, got that type of information which was kind of sad because I think a lot of them could have really used it um, so and the other question is I also worked in the library for a while um, and I noticed that the students uh, I, I, very few of them even checked out books and they used to read magazines but they don't even use magazines. And I, the school that I worked at had a terrific budget for, for both. Uh, is, can, you, can you comment on that? Yeah, certainly. So the state of New Jersey put in standards for financial literacy over the last couple of years. So every high school student has to take a half year course of financial literacy. They now added that to the middle school level. All kids are going to get financial literacy course in eighth grade by itself, it's a standalone course. So that addresses your first question about the banking and the basic knowledge of funding and working within a bank, financial literacy. Um, in addition, if you may have noticed on one of the slides, we're looking to bring back more business courses at the high school level, more advanced than just the basic financial literacy, entrepreneurship and the like. Those are part of the new courses we're going to be introducing as well. As far as the periodicals and the books, every student has their own Chromebook now. The online resources are endless, they're vast. So a lot of kids are accessing content through online platforms, web-based platforms, or any software that the, the schools may be giving them. It's a changing time in that regard. Hi. Thank you very much. This was a, a great lecture. I really appreciate it. I've been in Summit for 44 years. My kids, now my grandkids are in your system. And now I realize how, how hard a job you have. Uh, never realized that. Um, so you have a lot of experience. Um, you said 30 years in the, in the field. And um, I was wondering if you could comment on the evolution of the curriculum. My question is regarding the curriculum 
Um, I realize that you have implemented robotic computer um, computer science, which most of us here never um, attended in, when we were in high school. Uh, however, when we were in high school or middle school, we learned about Shakespeare, we learned about geography, we, uh, literature, and uh, all sorts of um, uh, basic, uh, I really believe those are basic knowledge. And um, seeing the curriculum of my grandkids, it seems like uh, uh, this is uh, uh, taking a back, steep, uh, back seat, sorry about that. It's taking a back seat uh, to those uh, programs uh, that you have. Um, so, uh, so my question is about the curriculum. How, you, how have you seen the curriculum evolve uh, along the years? And in that uh, direction, the, the further question is, uh, we know what's going on in the universities um, in this country, uh, which is taking a totally different turn because they are mixing politics with education. Uh, you mentioned in one of your slides, the goal number one, it's diversity, um, equality and, uh, and inclusion, uh, which is fine. But um, the universities have taken that to a, a dangerous level where they have mixed up the, the politics with, with the education. So, so the, the, the follow-up follow -up question is that how can you prevent such turn um, in, in your school? Thank you. Thank you, very good questions. Well, with regards to the curriculum, the State Department of Education puts out the standards. They're called the New Jersey Student Learning Standards. And that's basically the framework for what all schools and curriculum have to cover. And each standard has another substandard and a group and a strand. And it's a very detailed document that tells us what we're supposed to teach, basically. Um, when it comes to sort of the classics, I would say the evolution of the English language arts curriculum has changed over the years. Um, but we still address them. Students have choice now. Instead of maybe the entire class reading one book or one novel, there'll be a list for them to choose from. So they may or may not choose some of the classics, but they have access and availability to them. So our English language arts definitely still have the list of classics and our summer reading list, if you look at it online, has all the classics on it. Um, as far as the DEI and going on with the universities, we are anything, what's happening in Summit Public Schools is anything but what's happening in the universities. It's all about belonging, acceptance, and inclusivity. There are no politics here. When I took this initiative on, I made sure to make let the board and my staff know this is not political. We will keep politics out of schools. You may think with a type one district with the mayor appointing the board members that it's political. It's not the case. Our board is not political in any way. We do what's best for kids and we put kids first. And when I stepped into this role, that's my motto. I make every decision first what's what's best for kids and exposing them to politics. Thank you. Exposing them to politics or even some of their parents' points of view. And we get those phone calls. We get phone calls where parents feel this way or they feel that way about a certain topic. But we teach the standards and we don't go above and beyond either way. No extremism on either side. We're giving kids what they need at the level they need it based on the New Jersey student learning standards and feeling like they belong as part of the community. Hi, you do a great job in the school system. Uh, in your opinion, how much did the kids lose because of COVID? Great question. They talk about the learning gap. Um, we, we've, did our, we've done our best to measure that with a lot of our assessments. And you heard me talk about our online software where students will complete problems, so to speak, in any content area and do skills tests. And we'll be able to see where they are as it relates to where they should be in their grade level. I would say initially we were fearful that we were going to have a larger learning gap. We had very little. One of the reasons is we spent a lot of our COVID money. Schools got a ton of money from the government to put in programs. And what we do with our money is we target, let's say, the bottom 10% of students that need help and we'll make programs out the summer in English language arts and math where um, we invite students to do four days a week for five weeks, four or five weeks of additional instruction. Well, during COVID, we expanded that. We captured almost 50% of our elementary kids that wanted to be there just in case. And, we, and parents took advantage of it. So we've provided a lot of additional support 
to make sure that we bridge that gap. I would say standing here today after being this far removed from COVID, I don't think we have a gap. We don't have a gap in summer. We were in school from day one. So it isn't as if we had to pick it up and take so many more months to catch up. Now, it wasn't ideal. Kids were not learning at the pace or rigor when you're in for a half a day as you normally would. But I think we're far enough removed now to see. One of the things we are seeing though is there still seems to be some um, fallout with student behaviors from COVID. Some of the kids that maybe um, didn't have the opportunity to assimilate with their younger peers in kindergarten or first grade to the extent they do now, you're seeing those behaviors in second and third grade where you wouldn't see them because they would be maturing and developing. So that's one of the things some of our elementary schools are dealing with now is more that social emotional learning and wellness. That's why it's still at the forefront of our goals because the remnants of that development we still have to address. But as far as learning and academics, I think we're, we're doing it better than most in that regard. Uh, th thank you for a great talk. I think Summit is very fortunate to have you heading their school system. Uh, one of the questions I have is, where are you going to get the teachers to teach your new STEAM courses? Because those areas are very much in demand, uh, as you mentioned, from the outside. And these areas are also rapidly evolving. So it's good to be able to teach uh, skills and uh, knowledge to students that will stand them in good stead for the kind of world that we're entering five and 10 years into the future. Yeah, a lot of our um, robotics and coding courses require a math certification. So people who have an affinity for math and they can teach those higher level calculus, BC calc and the like are able to um, step into the coding and robotics courses. But the computer science courses, now the state is starting to recognize that and they've created new standards for that as well. And the computer science advanced placement courses and an AP test is coming. So this is evolving quickly. So what we were tasked to do is try to find people who have a skill set beyond just their certification as well. And we, we do that. We have people who go out and take workshops and, and become more experts in, in coding or robotics or computer science. And they're able to get, step into these courses and develop them. These are the people who actually will help write the curriculum. So when they develop the curriculum, they're the ones who know what they're going to be teaching. It's not as if we have a packaged curriculum here and we ask somebody to, to come and teach it right now. We're, we're hiring people that are going to help develop and write the curriculum. Well, thanks, Superintendent. Uh, I want to congratulate you. You brought the most number of people we've ever seen from a speaker. You got a whole platoon. And that has to, something to do with the question. Uh, I live in Morris Plains. That's up in Morris County, north of here. A lot of these guys are not real good in geography, so I got to <laughs> remind them. Uh, so your school budget is $81 million. You got 4,000 students. That's $20,000 per student. Uh, my school district, which combines Morristown, Morris Township, and Morris Plains, is probably similar. Uh, now, I have worked and lived overseas, including Scotland, Libya, and South America, so I've seen school systems close up and personal. You come from a pocket of prosperity, as well as I do, and as well as most of the people out here that probably pay taxes to your school district, right? I read an article that said the biggest source of inequality in America is the school system. Local taxes go to local schools and Newark and Camden and downtown Detroit suffer. Do you think that's fair? <laughs> well, welcome to Summit Old Park. <laughs> There's a lot there. Let me, let me frame my thought for a moment. Well, let me start with this. The funding mechanism for public schools in New Jersey has been talked about for many, many years. It has been changed and it's not equitable. Years ago, we had Abbott school districts where they threw tons of money at and expected a lot of great change and we didn't see that change. A lot of districts like Summit taxpayers dollars that go to the state, we don't get the same amount back. So it's not equitable. I don't have the answer, that's beyond, beyond me. Um, but I think our cost per pupil is less than 20,000. Derek, what do you have for that? It's about $18,000 per pupil. 
Um, but when you factor in some of the higher costs for special needs programs and things like that, that's what those numbers get a little higher. But around the area, we're pretty good with our cost per pupil. We're pretty efficient. Um, no, I don't think it's fair. But what we can control is in Summit Public Schools with the money we do have going back to the belonging and inclusivity and making it equitable for all families. And that's a goal of ours. We're committed to that. Um, we, we, we have families in Summit who multiple families live in basements together. And you can d drive down the street and see multi-million dollar houses. So it's very diverse socio socioeconomically. And all the kids from all the neighborhoods come together in our middle school in grade six. And they're together. And we value each and every one of them. So that's what we try to make what's equitable in our classrooms for our, the funds that we have for our resources in the classroom. I don't have the answer. I wish I did. My name is Edward Atkin. I've done high school officiating in tennis for like nine years, including several matches at your school. So I always want to give your school a compliment for your AD always coming and seeing the matches. But the question I have is, my mother was a math teacher in Elizabeth for like over 20 years. I'd like to know when a kid, let's say, moves from Elizabeth to Summit, they're probably several years behind level, like, you know, from geometry. How do you handle those type of students? And also, my mother, you know, I don't know how you do special ed. They did inclusion in Elizabeth. My mother, they had family. So how can my mother teach a kid learning sight words, algebra one and geometry? He's learning algebra. They master addition and subtraction. How do you teach a kid like that mm -hmm. in a family? Thank you. So for your first question, we get, yes, some it's very rigorous. So we get students move in from other communities and they may not have the same level of skills they may. So we test them first, we see where they're at. At the elementary level, we really employ that, that triangle that you saw, which is if they need the extra help to catch up, we will pull them out and give them small group or specialized instruction to get them caught up and back on grade level. Once they get into the middle school and high school, we have leveled courses. So we don't, they don't all take math seven. We may have an enriched math seven or a pre-algebra, and our goal is to get all eighth graders or as many eighth graders as we can to take algebra. If they're not ready, they take algebra in grade nine. Okay, so they're leveled courses once you hit grade six that go up through um, grade 12, all the way to advanced placement BC calculus. So that's where students will get the, the level of instruction that they can handle. And of course we push and we try to have them advance as much as possible. Right now, currently, we're looking at the, at the middle school of what we can do in English language arts to get a little bit more differentiation so that we don't have much of that in the middle school, but at the high school, again, we do. We have regular courses, we have honors, we have advanced placement. Some of the kids that come from different communities that don't speak the language as well, we have what's called sheltered instruction, which is going to be a different way to teach kids that don't have the language acquisition skills that they need to learn. So we're, we're building that up at the same time as we're giving them content. So we have different courses all throughout at that upper levels that are specifically created for individual student needs. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. You've outlined a, a very impressive and very ambitious program, both in terms of academics and in the phys physical facilities needed to uh, make those academics realizable. But how does teacher preparation play into this? You outline your needs. Are your needs being met by teacher schools? Do they know what you need and are they providing what you need? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about this aspect, please? Okay, if I understand your question properly, how do we know our teachers are prepared and, and how do we prepare them further to do what we need them to do? So yes. every teacher that we hire um, goes through a week long orientation program in the summer before the start of the school year. That's where they learn sort of our pedagogy, our expectations, our curriculum, they sit through a whole week of that training. We even take the, our new hiring staff on a city bus tour of Summit to see the sites so that they get involved in the community. From there, we follow them for two years. They do professional development targeted specifically for first two year teachers on teaching and learning depending on what level or what content they're in. Beyond that, we have professional development days, six of them throughout the school year, 
where we will do everything specifically targeted between technology. They'll go into their departments, whether it's English language arts, math, they'll go into their elementary um, STEAM programs. We give them opportunity throughout the year and it's PD designed by us for us, professional development. It's not just taking a course or a webinar, it's designed by our own people, delivered by our own people, for our own people, to, do the, to give them the skills and the resources that they need. By the way, I'm a 1946 graduate of Summit High. <laughs> uh, I have a handicapped son, and his day in this school system, Summit, New Providence, and Berkeley Heights had a joint program. I just wondered what your current special education program is. Thank you for that. Special education in New Jersey is uh, highly revered. And some it's no different. We have a lot of in-house programs where we try to keep kids in our school system. The more severely disabled students have to go out to specialized schools. Our percentage of keeping most of those students in summit schools are, is very, very good. Um, we have specialized programs for um, what's called ABA or LLD, and they're self-contained classrooms that are specific to the disability of those students. And the classes aren't going to be larger than maybe six or eight kids. Okay. Um, as far as shared services, we still do that. We look around from district to district, and we currently have a program at the high school where we take kids from other school districts and they pay us tuition because they can't take care of the needs of the students in their home district. And we, we're looking to continue to expand that. It's a small source of revenue for us, but it also keeps um, our programs running because as kids age out of our programs or go to another school or graduate, we still want to keep our, our, our programs in place that we have in our schools. We just built a brand new life skills lab at the high school last year, which our more severely disabled students practice laundry, cooking, acts of daily living. And we have some students from other communities that send their kids here to us for that program. My cats. Mike. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Scott, thank you very much for an outstanding presentation, and uh, I am uh, really pleased to come to the conclusion that the Summit school system is in very good hands indeed. Uh, I guess there's many things I could ask. I'll just ask a couple of questions um, based on things that I've observed, uh, maybe nationally, and wondering how uh, the Summit school system has a problem with that in these areas, or if so, how they're addressing it. One is that uh, I think there is a very great uh, lack of education regarding uh, civics and government that uh, see manifest every day. And I was wondering, is uh, civics and government or political science or social studies, whatever you call it, uh, a requirement in the summit uh, curriculum? And the other question I had is that uh, I've been hearing about attacks on uh, library systems, both public libraries and uh, those in uh, school systems uh, where uh, groups seek to uh, require that certain books that they uh, don't approve of be removed. And I'm wondering if there are any issues of that kind going on in the summit. Hey, thank you for the question. As far as civics, yes, we our seventh and eighth grade curriculum has uh, civics and government. So every student goes through that. Um, and it is underneath the social studies standards. Um, they have not removed that. Um, they may not be as highlighted as it is in the past with a lot of the other things that happen on in schools, but it's still there. So our seventh and eighth grade students do get courses in civics and government. Um, as far as book removal, um, luckily here in Summit, we have not had, and hopefully this doesn't start anything, um, a push towards taking a look at that. Um, we have libraries in the classrooms. Going back to the Summit Educational Foundation, they donate books to us all the time, every year. So kids have choice of books. Um, we really haven't had to deal with any controversy of titles. Um, we really don't talk about different titles that are a problem. Um, nothing's been brought to my attention. We do have a board policy. If there is content of a book or a resource that wants to be or needs to be removed, we would follow that process. But thankfully here, again, you know, I often talk to parents about this, you know, what we see on TV and what we see in the mainstream media and what we see in a lot of other states 
that happens, it's out there and we have to be careful about it. We have to watch it and we have to make sure we're staying in our lane um, and not getting involved in those things. We're not immune to it, but so far, um, as of today, we're, we're doing pretty well on all those hot topics that you, you might want to reference like this one here. Um, so I'd like to also thank you for a fine presentation and for the wonderful work you're doing in Summit for uh, Summit Schools. And I'd like to uh, amplify a comment that Alan Hamilton made a few minutes ago. Uh, we had very large turnout today, both online and in person. And I was afraid that that wouldn't happen because Summit, despite its, Summit Old Guard, despite its name, is actually not largely a Summit organization. We actually have slightly under 17% of our members living in Summit and slightly over 17% living in New Providence. Not, you know, New Providence after all is kind of like the center of gravity. Now, I know that you worked for a number of years for the school system in New Providence. So maybe a lot of New Providence people show up because they know you from that. But it did occur to me uh, that uh, apart from athletic um, uh, competitions and, and now special needs students, how much do, does the school system, the summit school system and, and the management uh, interact with the other, you know, top high schools in the region and you know with cooperative programs or or you know talking about um, best practices or you know sharing resources or whatever yes thank you for the question the truth of the matter that uh, public school in new jersey is a very small community we know everybody knows each other all of my colleagues i meet routinely with all of the superintendents in the county union county every month um, we talk i'm friendly with them we meet at our professional development conferences we share best practices. We talk about partnering on things. When it comes to athletics right now, our Summit wrestling team is in a co-op with Chatham. So Chatham students and Summit students are on the same team, right? So we take advantage of maximizing resources in that area where we can. Um, but it's a small community. And even my colleagues from my cabinet here, they know people from other districts as well. And we're constantly talking best practices, curriculum, instruction, and mostly again, you know, labor, labor market. Um, we tell each other to stop stealing each other's teachers. <laughs> yes, um, I have a question about uh, uh, students that are perhaps not headed for college uh, as far as uh, any training in the trades or are you connected with Union County Vocational Tech or any of that sort of thing? Let's say uh, uh, plumbing, electricity. I remember in high school taking an electricity course to this day. I've but I did, uh, although I never, you know, I was in an office my whole life. But maybe you could touch on that a little bit. Yeah, thankfully we do have Union County Votech, and I think we send about two buses down there every day. Uh, kids that want to take advantage of the technical skills and studying in those various areas. We have full-time students that go down to the Union County Votech, and we have half-time. They'll go down for half a day, and then the other half of the day they're at Summit High School. We still have woodshop and programs in our high school now. Um, and we kind of really try to use that to help with the tech design and take it to the next level. So they're building sets and the like. Um, but as far as some of those other technical skills and vocations, um, we have probably a good hundred kids that take advantage of the Union County Votech. Something, something quick. Uh, do, the, do the schools have artificial or natural turf for their athletic fields? So we take advantage of Tatlock, which is a city owned field, but we play a lot of our lacrosse, soccer and football games down there. That is turf. So we work with the city to maintain that. Um, the upper field at the high school location on site of our property is a turf field. And we are now in the process of that lower field, which is grass along Morris Avenue. We will be turfing that as well. A few years ago, I was very disturbed by the emphasis on STEM, 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 and I was very delighted to hear you change it to STEAM. <laughs> and so indeed, in my family, <clears throat> music is very important. So I'd like you to describe music and education, uh, participation, 
the uh, orchestras, the bands, everything in, in the music area. It's essentially a, a huge part of our identity in Summit. Our arts, music, performing arts are second to none. Um, we have accolades, a long list of accolades of speech and debate contests that we win. Um, we have the right people teaching that. We have band, orchestra, and chorus that don't just perform through their annual programs and schools. They compete across the state of New Jersey, and they get invited to other competitions. I'm not familiar with all of them myself. I know that it's a huge part of what makes Summit Summit. We have large participation. Our kids are playing their instruments all through the grade levels up through high school, and it's something we want to safeguard. Some districts have taken the A out of STEAM and made a STEM. We're not going to ever do that in Summit because we value the arts and the music, and it's a, it's a big part of who we are. Thank you. you know, very informative. Thank you very much. But I'm just wondering, this is kind of a, a, a unique situation, um, and almost uh, with respect to cooperation that you've discussed, uh, unique in that way. But as, as you look internationally, it appears that the United States is dropping uh, in in um, its status as a leader in education. All the statistics are showing that we're lower down uh, versus other countries. And now we have local communities like Summit, which is really an example of the way it should be done. And then you've got other local uh, communities that are different and they, um, um, they may emphasize other ways to teach. Is I, I want to keep the politics out, but but how do we how do we get some? And I know there's a hot button. You know we we've got local education, and possibly we may have some national standards, which I'm not aware of. But we we, we seem to have uh, th this inequality in education across the country, and 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 it's a local issue. How how do we get some uniformity or at least standards? Uh, so that we're competitive in the world. And as the world is changing, instead of dropping, we're rising. That's a great question. Um, one of the unique things about public education in New Jersey is local control. It's not like that throughout the other parts of the country. You won't have a small community like New Providence or Summit deciding for its own. It's more county-based and larger districts. Um, perhaps that plays into the standard because many people in New Jersey with the Board of Eds want to keep and maintain that local control and make their own decisions. As far as international standards, there, there aren't any. There is international baccalaureate curriculum, which some high schools adapt, which is a little bit more aligned with countries outside of the United States. Summit Public Schools is not an IB school. Um, we're New Jersey Student Learning Standards and we're remaining there. Um, but I, I, I I don't know how we can compete in other countries when their systems are vastly different from ours. For example, some other country systems at the end of eighth grade will decide whether or not they're going to continue through a traditional high school because they meet the scores or they go in a vocational school. And a um, long time ago, I visited um, uh, um, uh, Denmark and I looked at their educational system. And that's exactly what they did. At the end of eighth grade, it's going to decide if you are a high academic performer, you're going to continue with your academic um, studies. If you're not, you're going to go in a different pathway, right? That's about as much as I know about some foreign um, public, uh, educational systems. But we educate everybody through 12th grade. We don't kick people out and say you can't continue with your 12th grade. So when you look at the different communities around the country, it's, it's vastly different the way local control is run and or um, the different makeup of regional. I know that regionally people talk about different parts of the country that don't perform anything like New Jersey. New Jersey is always in the top two or three states in the United States as far as academic performance. So we're very fortunate in that way. But you've also pointed out the disparity amongst the communities in New Jersey. You can just hit a golf ball down the road and it's going to be very different in that community than what we do here. Um, I'm focused on Summit. I know we work hard to try to keep up with all of our peer districts and we're doing that. Um, I wish I had some of the solutions to some of the larger problems that are facing education as a whole. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. And particularly, I think you probably took two dozen questions. You didn't dodge any of them, you answered them all. Uh, we have for you a 
a certificate of appreciation. Thank you.